Should work. Okay. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Thank you all for coming. I'm Robert Buxton. I've been here before. It's yes. been oh, maybe a few months, and I just want to thank. I don't know where Marla went, Marla. but yeah. thank you, Marla, very much for for having me. And if we can give Marla a big round of applause, I don't know if you can hear it, but. Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit like I did before. I'm still doing the same theme, but different repertoire. And that theme is the violin. And I have a story behind it that I, during the pandemic, I watched several documentaries, one of which is called The Art of Violin. It's on uh, YouTube. It's a PBS documentary. Mm. Very, very good. And it's all about Yehudi <clears throat> Menuhin, Yasha Heifetz, Nathan Milstein, you name it, the great violinists of the past. I watched this thing and I said to myself, I'm, I'm sick of piano, I want to play that. I want to play violin. And the repertoire is so great. And I told my wife, who's also a musician, she's a pianist, and she said, um, okay, but she gave me this look. <laughs> and I said, what are you thinking? What are you really thinking? And she said, I know someone who switched instruments and it was just a lot of trouble. It took years. So. I said, very, very well. We just had our first kid at the time, first son. So time, you know, I, I'm too lazy to do that. I said to myself, so plan B was to play violin repertoire transcribed. Yeah, arranged for the, for the piano. And there's a lot. There's arrangements of Liszt and Rachmaninoff and others. And some of the pieces I'm playing, funny enough, they're originally for piano but you hardly hear them on piano. You normally hear them on the violin. And that's what I'll start with. Um, this is a piece by Mendelssohn called May Breezes. It's a piano piece from the Songs Without Words, but you often hear it in Fritz Kreisler's arrangement for violin. It's usually how you'd hear it. Oh, maybe I used the microphone. I forgot about that. <clears throat> Might be easier. How's that? Well, yeah. <laughs> it's a little too close. Then I don't have to talk <clears throat> so loud. That's good. Um, anyway, this first piece is May Breezes by Felix Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn was uh, born in 1809. <clears throat> he was German Jewish composer and didn't live very long, unfortunately, like many at that time, like Schubert and Mozart. He didn't reach 40, which is just tragic. And, um, I had a teacher who said very well about Mendelssohn. He said, Mendelssohn, the way to describe him was he was more Mozartian than Mozart himself. <laughs> Meaning that he was, and this is not to disrespect Mozart at all, but the young Mozart had a lot of help from his dad on the early stuff. A lot. The scholars they found, Leopold sort of touched up a lot. <laughs> But not Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn was like four years old and writing. Brilliant. Yeah, it's just something else. And more than that, you know, he was genuine as a person and as a musician. Those things often go together. You can feel it's like he wears his heart on his sleeve in his music. This piece, you'll feel it. He's a warm and honest person. Maybe not all musicians, I'm sorry um, to say. But um, anyway, and you can see why this is done on the violin very much. It's very melodic. For some reason, it reminds me of, you know, those old 19th century houses with front porches, usually somewhere in rural areas. Mm -hmm. I can't describe it, but this piece reminds me of that, even the, the smell. Is. And the May Breezes, the accompaniment sounds like um, May Breezes, which we don't have now, but you know. <laughs> melodies on top of that. So we'll start with that. Here is Mendelssohn, May Breezes. <laughs> Thank you. 
time. I'm not going exactly chronologically here. This is a gavat by Bach from the third partita for solo violin, and it's arranged for piano by Sergei Rachmaninoff. Uh, some people call this Bachmaninoff. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you a couple stories about the composers that you might not find in the history books. One of them, did you know Bach spent a night in jail? <laughs> it's true, he did. He pulled a knife on an oboe player in a rehearsal. <laughs> I, yeah, I found that funny when I, you know, so... Because I want to paint the picture of these, of the composers. They were geniuses, yes, but they were human. I'm not saying that all humans pull knives on oboe players, but just the, the idea that... Um, but in all seriousness, you know, Bach was a very devout, he was very religious, he was a church musician most of his life, and the curious thing is that these are secular dances. This is a gavotte is a French Baroque dance. It has nothing to do with the church. So what, um, well, there's some musicologists who believe that he had some biblical scene in mind for each of these dances. I don't know what that might be, but it's just an interesting thought. And another, where I read someone said that in Bach, the, um, as they put it, Lutheran hymns are like the wallpaper behind everything. So, you know, even in this dance. So, about Rachmaninoff, he was a Russian composer, lived from 1873 to 1943. Um, and he was, to describe him, he was six and a half feet tall about. May have had Marfan syndrome, that's a recent thing. He had a shaved head, he never smiled, you know. He was Russian, so my mother's Russian, and she's very warm and everything, but Russian culture can be very, you know. So he was intimidating, let's say, to many. Uh, Stravinsky, I think, called him a six and a half foot scowl. So I have a story my grandfather met. My dad is not Russian, he's from Virginia, so my dad's uh, father, my grandfather, was an usher at a recital given by Rachmaninoff. It's a true story. And uh, he was told not to let anyone through this door. Mm -hmm. So 10 minutes later, somebody tried to open the door. My grandfather was pushing back, and there was a struggle there. Well, then, wham, this person kicked the door open. It was Rachmaninoff no. himself. Yeah, and do you know what he said to uh, my grandfather? He spoke to him. He said, get out of my way. So I have a personal connection to the, uh, to the great composer. He told my grandfather to get out of his way. So um, anyway, like in literature, you know, Rachmaninoff is not taking this piece verbatim and putting it to the piano. He's adding a lot and turning it into it's a whole different piece from the original. It's a piano work. And by the end, it's, I, I think there's a progression. It starts closer to Bach. And gradually, by the end, it becomes more and more Rachmaninoff, and you can hear Russian bells. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's just more and more Rachmaninoff takes over. So here it is. Yeah, there we go. Okay. I don't want it on because I'm here. <laughs> <laughs>
entrance by Franz Liszt. Uh, I think I did one or two of these last time, but not these ones. Um, yeah, so Paganini was, he lived in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and he was a, a wild man. He was like a rock star of today, maybe. He really was even quite controversial in some circles at that time. There were people who thought he was possessed. Um, the way, even the way he looked was just um, frightening even. He, I think he may have also had Mark Hansen, interesting <laughs> thought, but I read that somewhere. But someone, Ivory Gitlis, who's one of my absolute favorite violinists ever, he said that, um, he said, Paganini was like the great bang, the big bang in music, so, uh, mixing up words of the big bang. That because his style was just so sui generis, it was, it, you can't really put it or pin it to any tradition. Bach, you can kind of, you can say, well, Buxtehude, Telemann, you know, this, you could put it, or, or Mendelssohn, you could trace it back. But Paganini was just, he was just his own thing. Um, and the way he played violin was just, it was so outrageous even for that time. So Franz Liszt, who was born a bit later, born in 1811, Liszt was in Paris in his 20s and actually kind of in a, in a low point in his life, he was kind of depressed, actually. Um, I don't know how you could be in Paris, but that's a different story. So, um, and he heard Paganini play. And that was it. it. Paganini was this huge inspiration for all the romantics because he was that free spirit, you know, the rock musician thing. That just appealed to the romantics. And Liszt, the legend is he locked himself up for a few years to practice incessantly while reading books by Dante and Shakespeare, becoming educated, self-educated men. And in a few years, he emerged as Franz Liszt, the, the one that we remember now. And so what he did in this period, the first thing he did was arrange some of Paganini's violin music. And what I'm going to play now are two um, arrangements from the 24 Caprices for solo violin. The first one is called La Chasse, which means the hunt. And um, this is the sound of hunting horn calls. That's why it's called that. Now, having grown up in northern New Jersey, I, I didn't hunt and I don't hunt, but um, if someone knows more about hunting, they can correct me, but I have a few thoughts on this. One is that in those days they didn't have cell phones so they needed to point out where the hunters locations were so they would use french horns or predecessor of the french horn that's one thing and maybe also the horns would attract those sounds would attract certain animals i don't know or repel certain i don't know but at any rate i mean you couldn't go into a, a walmart and buy a duck whistle at that time so just the strange things i think about but um but at any rate, this is this is a piece called La Chasse, the Hunt, and this idea of hunting and horn calls. Any listener in the 18th century would have a lot of associations with that sound. The countryside, you know, it's a thing. There's books about it, that musical associations. We have them today. I mean, if I were to play the theme to a TV show, you'd have immediately a certain association to. So, um, but at any rate, this is La Chasse, The Hunt by Paganini, originally but arranged by Franz Liszt for piano. Mm -hmm.
another one, this one is based on the very first of the 24 caprices, it's called the arpeggio. It's also in the same key of E, I just realized, but um, this piece, interestingly, the arrangement of the list, it's not too different from the original. You know, that one, there's, you don't have those notes in the violin, solo violin. List, of course, added that. But this one doesn't go below this note, which is the lowest note of the violin. And so it's pretty, you know, original, or faithful to the original. Sometimes in literary translations, you have that. You have a, a translation that is almost word for word. The same, sometimes you have it has just wildly different. So um, when I learned this piece, I was stuck with it because I felt, you know, usually I have some sort of image or story that comes to mind. But for this, I didn't. For this, I felt it was, it felt like an exercise. And it's not, of course, it's not. And so I played it for my wife. I said, what do you hear? And so we have two kids and two cats. So I tell people we have four kids, because that's really what it is. And um, we have this kitten who's no longer, well, he's still a kitten, okay. But anyway, he has this toy, and it's a merry-go-round. It's a ball that goes around, and he hits it in it. And she said, I imagine him playing with that, because he plays with it all day and all night, and it's kind of annoying. But um, let me play you the opening. Because it goes, the piece goes in circles. It, even my left hand is like the cat's off. And you know, um, on the violin, it's it's a ricochet, like that. But on the piano, I have to do this. It's very strange, but you know, you just gotta deal with it. Pretending to be a violinist here. So I think Paganini might have approved of the the. The humor, I mean the funny connotation, because I think part of the key to his music is sarcastic wit. And cats, maybe not knowingly, although I think they do, they're the masters of that. So anyway, this is the, um, the kitten, one. I mean that's my name for my wife's, but this is the arpeggio piece Paganini list. tell you they were many things they were great and Liszt was a great person he was he was a great musician and he's in some 
Some people say he was superficial, he was a showman. It's just not true. I used to think that it's not true at all. If you look at the, the whole range of the things listed in his arrangements, his original compositions, he was a brilliant, you know, genius. But one thing he was not was humble. That's for sure. He would go to royalty after concerts and give them his hand oh. to kiss. So he was not humble. Um, and Brahms, who I'm going to play a very short piece by Brahms now, this is waltz in A flat. It's very famous and violent. You hear it on violin sometimes. So that's why I'm playing it on this program. Uh, Brahms and Liszt, let's just say they, they hated each other. I mean, it was a, the young Brahms, Brahms was a bit younger. He traveled around Europe and met a lot of the great composers. Most notably, probably the, the Schumanns, Robert and Clara Schumann. And back to that in a bit. But when he went to Liszt, uh, Liszt played his B minor sonata, which is an incredible genius piece of music, but very, very long. And young Brahms fell asleep in the middle. And Liszt was not thrilled. And they were just, and they stood for different things. You know, Liszt stood for kind of innovation and progressiveness in musical composition. Brahms was a classicist. You know, he was, he loved Beethoven and, and Bach, and even before, the music from before that time, um, and collected scores, you know, Renaissance music. So he was a classicist, you could say. Um, another thing about Brahms that should be addressed, I think, is his relationship with Clara Schumann. And I'm not, I know Valentine's Day, I'm not seeking to be a People magazine here. It's not clear if they were dating or whatnot. But Clara Schumann, the widow of Robert Schumann, and Brahms were very close and um, exchanged letters. And you can really feel there was some sort of, well, I don't want to go there, but you get the idea. There was something there. And, um, you know, Clara, by the way, was a great composer and pianist herself, and she's getting performed more and more now, which is great. Um, but you might know someone like this, like Brahms, who's on the surface kind of formal and cool, but underneath volcanic emotions, you know. And I think that this piece is like that, too. So it's very short, but here's the A-flat waltz. You've probably heard it. It's pretty famous. So. <clears throat> American pianist Seymour Bernstein is wonderful. He's in his mid or late 90s now. And he told a story that he performed in Newark, New Jersey somewhere. It was for a group of retired Viennese widows. I don't know why, but that's what, in, probably in the 40s. And this lady came up to him and she said, I'm, you know, 100 something years old and I heard uh, he, he played some Brahms there. And she said, I heard Brahms play those pieces at Clara Schumann's funeral uh -uh. in Vienna. 
And Seymour Bernstein almost fainted. <laughs> but he collected himself and, of course, asked the question, well, how did he play it? Tell me everything you remember. And she said, how did he play it? He played awful. Obviously, you play much better. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just thought that was such a funny story. Um, there, there was a review, and this is, I mean, Brahms was a wonderful pianist, but there was a review of his second piano concerto that said, the, the critic said, clearly Brahms took more care to write the correct notes than to play them, so. <laughs> yeah, so here's another composer who had a glorious 19th century beard like Brahms. Brahms looked like Santa Claus in his later mm -hmm. years. Uh, this is Dvorak, who was Czech. And Dvorak, you know, was, he was inspired very much by folk music. In the case of Eastern Europe, is mostly gypsy music. And he actually loved American folk music. Dvorak was in this country for a while. He was in New York teaching, um, and then he actually spent a summer in Iowa. The American String Quartet and the New World Symphony are all inspired by African American spirituals that he heard here and uh, Native American music even. So he, he really was, um, he loved, you know, folk music is kind of the raw material of his mm -hmm. style, I would say. And this first piece I'm going to do of Dvorak is a, it's famous, it's the songs my mother taught me, mm -hmm. originally for voice, violinists play it a lot. This is an arrangement by a Russian uh, composer, Eduard Schutt. It's a German name, but Russian, you know. So, um, and, it, you know, the songs my mother taught me, they're from the Gypsy songs. So there you go, there's the Gypsy music connection. I was listening to Paul Robeson sing this in English. Great, great version. And the text, it's very moving. It's, um, I recall the songs my mother taught me and now I teach them to my children that's kind of the, the gist of it so here it is this arrangement is almost like an improvisation on the original so songs my mother taught me divorce
more Dvorak piece. This is the famous G flat humoresque, and it's a piano piece originally, but you always hear it on the violin. There's a wonderful recording of Misha Elman playing it. It's a video from 1926. You can find it on YouTube. It's just it's incredible magic. Um, this piece, humoresque, it means humorous, of course. But this piece has a lot of sadness in it as well. It's the kind of humor you might find in Charlie Chaplin, where he'll make you laugh and cry also. So here is the piece of humoresque of Dvorak. Somebody put some slightly off-color lyrics to this, I think. I don't know them, so but Tom Lehrer or somebody wrote... Anyway, it's just... Maybe you recognize it. <laughs> personally, but I think, um, and I have a story about this, that there's, in some circles of academia, Dvorak is not liked at all, and as a friend of mine told me, it's, well, because he sounds too good, you know, he can't, can't take music that actually sounds good, too. but I know this person, I won't name them, that is in academia, and they, they hate Dvorak, just hate Dvorak, and I challenged, I said, well, why? 
and this person said, you know, he's a pianist. He said, I just, I, I feel like I'm on a farm when I'm listening to his music. Mm -hmm. I can almost, I can even smell the cows. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, um, you know, there's, he's given me two reasons to love Dvorak even more. Number one, I love rural areas, having never experienced that in New Jersey. And um, number two is the fact that <laughs> when somebody hates, sometimes hate is a strong, you know, it means there's something there. So it elicited that feeling. Anyway, it just came to my mind. That, so now I'm going to play two Spanish-themed pieces. This first one is by Polish composer Moritz Moskowski. Does that name ring a bell? He's not too famous now, but in his time, around the turn of the last century, he was pretty uh, well-known. And Vladimir Horowitz played a lot of his pieces, for instance, so he was... And it's too bad, you know, I think he's a wonderful, wonderful composer. And very salon style, you know, very light and airy, and maybe that's why he's less popular. Now, classical music likes to be only, you know, deadly serious now. So, um... Yeah, this, you know, Moskowski was born in Poland, lived in Germany, and what's interesting is that, unlike Mendelssohn, you know, he was Jewish as well, and he did not convert. Like Alcon, who was a French uh, Jewish composer, Alcon was very religious, he did not convert. Mendelssohn did. There's a whole history of this because of the anti-Semitism in Europe, and, um, but Moskowski, you know, was proudly um, in the faith, and it's just, it's really wonderful. So, um, what else would I say about this piece? He was going for a Spanish theme, although it, it doesn't really sound like flamenco, but it has that feeling to it. And his friend, Pablo de Sarasate, who was a Spanish violinist, you know, he heard this piano piece, and he said, Moritz, you know, to Moscow, so you've got to arrange this for the violin. It's going to be a hit. And he did, and then after that, you hardly hear it on the piano. Well, I'm playing the original piano piece because I never got around to learning the violin, <laughs> so maybe next time I'll come, no, I'm just kidding, That's, I gave up on that. So here is the piece, it's called Guitar by Morris Moskowski. <laughs>
that piece. It's like the bubbles in champagne or Prosecco. You know, that. that. <laughs> so, um, anyway, here's another Spanish themed piece. This is Malagueña by Isaac Albanese. I don't know how. Can I go a little past three? I don't know. If you need to go, it's okay. I don't want to overstay my, my welcome. Okay, no rush. Okay. Because I talk, you know, I talk too much. That's the problem. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I talk a lot. And um, this piece is called it's called Malagueña by Isaac Albanese. Albanese, you know, he was Catalan, curiously enough, but it was the music of the south of Spain, flamenco music, that was his biggest inspiration. And from what I understand, he was as a young man, he was a very brilliant pianist and composer, and he was in Paris, where you know everyone was at that time, and. But he didn't, he hadn't found his voice yet as a musician, and it was when he started to emulate flamenco music that things really took off for him. And this is one of those, I think it's one of the earlier pieces doing that. So flamenco music, we need to talk about it a little because it's like the history of Spain, it's just a melting pot of things. Spain in the Middle Ages was Arabic, and so the music, Arabic music of the Middle East and flamenco music, they're very connected because it's infused with, you know, flamenco is infused with that. And so, I mean, just listen to the opening, I'll see what I mean, which sounds like a flamenco guitar or an Arabic oud, which is a lute, you know. And this left hand is like a vocalist, it's very plaintive, you know. It's like an improvisation. You have the singer up here, and I don't know the flamenco singers. They will vocalize on vowels like ha 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 ha. I can't sing, you know, but like this. Then the guitar takes over. Question and answer, you know. Taste of Spain. There's a restaurant in Rockland County, New York, right near where I grew up. Ride my bike right there now. And it's called, if anyone's from that area, it's called A Taste of Spain. That's this piece for me. It's A Taste of Spain. Good food, by the way.
baby, should I do two more? I, they're a little, not that long, but they're each one like five minutes. So um, th this is, a, I'll do it now. So this is Bartok and uh, the Romanian folk dances of Bartok. There's six very short pieces connected, you know. So Bartok was a fascinating composer. On, on the one hand, he was definitely part of musical modernism. Some people are scared by Bartok because you're going to hear things like like that, uh, which are like Picasso in painting and breaking the uh, realistic images and going into abstraction. But um, I think even more important than that is the fact Bartok was so obsessed with folk music, just like uh, Albanese there and Dvorak, and it's, it's connected, it's similar. And Bartok with his buddy Zoltan Kodai, another Hungarian composer, they went out in the late 19th century with an early tape recorder and they recorded people in villages singing folk music. A lot of these traditions have sadly since died out. And you had similar things, you know, happen in this country with much from Bartok's influence that people like Alan Lomax going and recording the music, people singing in Appalachia, for example. So. The, these Romanian folk dances, they're very much based on what he heard in Romanian villages. So the music of Romania, it's a little bit like Spain in the sense it's a melting pot. And particularly before the, the Second World War, um, it's a mix of gypsy music and klezmer music. And you're going to hear both of that in here. It's really a blend of those two styles of music. And I love these pieces. To me, they're like snapshots of village life. Each one is like 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, I play them straight through. Um, there is a violin version that Bartok himself played with Joseph Shigeti violins, not spaghetti, but Shigeti. <laughs> I always tell people. So um, I will name you the pieces. This The first one is called Stick Game, which is, I guess, what kids used to play before iPads and computers. You know, um, <laughs> and klezmer feel already. So the second one is called um, Peasant Costume. And the costumes of uh, rural areas of southern Poland and the eastern Europe, they're very colorful and, and bright, white and red and such. So the next one is a very creepy piece. It sounds like it's, I like it for Halloween. I played it for my kids because um, it sounds like that. It's called Standing Still. And it's, I feel like my head should start turning around. So the, the next one is called Mountain Horn Song. It's, to Boone or Asheville and in the early morning there's that fog or mist in the mountain. To me that's this piece. I, I feel like the smell of it. The last two are rather upbeat. This one is called Romanian Garden Gate. It's, uh, and then it segues into the last one which is um, which is called uh, the Little One. Um,
do uh, one more piece here. This is the Etude en forme de valse by Saint-Saëns, French composer. Um, it means study in the form of a waltz, sort of a waltz, sort of not a waltz. And I'll tell you about Saint-Saëns. He was a brilliant guy, you know, friends with Liszt, and he sort of straddled two generations. He lived a long time, and he was a 19th century romantic through and through, but he lived well into the 20th century and absolutely hated things like Bartok's pieces and Stravinsky's. He famously walked out or stormed out of the premiere of the Rite of Spring, and he, uh, the opening oboe solo, and he said something off color while leaving in French. At any rate, uh, I'll tell you a story about Saint-Saëns when he was young. As a 10-year-old, he played his first recital in Paris. And by the way, he was, he did everything. He was a philosopher, archaeologist, animal rights activist. I mean, he, he was one of those people who just did everything. He was 10 years old. He finished his debut recital in Paris. And this kid, you know, he turns to the audience and he says, which of the 32 Beethoven sonatas would you like me to play? I have them all memorized. <laughs> what a brat to say that. So, <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, this piece is, um, I think this piece is very funny because of the violent contrasts. I imagine Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd in some scenario. And that, you know, you can, you can imagine many things that Bugs Bunny dresses up as something and he's being almost tender, you know. realizes what's going on. So it, it just shifts very, very quickly. And that's, I think, the, the humor, the contrast is what makes the humor. It's, it's a very funny piece. <laughs>
think I've ran a little bit over. I usually, I sometimes play a little Southern Gospel improvisation. <laughs> I don't know if you want to hear it. Um, I could do one. Uh, this is Bringing in the Sheaves. I did not pick this up in New Jersey. This is being run. <laughs> so I'll do Bringing in the Sheaves. It's an old time gospel thing. Just to go. Thank you very, very much for coming. If you need to leave, just please don't, don't hesitate, but just play one more here. So. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful Sunday. And if you're watching the Super Bowl, I'll well enjoy. I don't know if I will, but why not? Any reason to eat, right? So <laughs> thank you so much for, for coming. Bye -bye. Thank you.